It's an immense privilege uh, to be with you and an incredible privilege to follow Jackie. What I want to do as we think about the effects of the fall is to invite you into a realm that very few people wish to enter. Uh, it takes such courage to open your own heart, to begin to address things that you know to be true, know to be true about yourself, but also know to be true about the world in which you live. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to consider is what the effect of the fall is with regard to shame and contempt. Uh, the passage that Jackie read, if you go back one verse uh, to chapter 2, verse 25, it says, and Adam and his wife were naked and they knew no shame. Now, let me tell you, whatever it is that you do on this earth, Look for dark places. Look for dark places because those are the places where the very light of God is most demonstrable, clear, and overwhelming. And our task today is to step into the fact that no one in this room, no one has escaped the reality of living in a world in which you have no nakedness and you have known what it is in that exposure of nakedness to actually feel the sharp pointed edge of a finger or eyes that belittle you, that make you feel small and stupid. These are daily events. These are not just huge categories with regard to how we function in the world, but you know politics. You know in so many ways classes you've been in. For you to hold your faith, often will have a sneer on the part of someone else. This is the fact that we need to address as we look at the rest of the passage in Genesis chapter 3. So again, if you have your Bible, listen and engage with me. Let me start with verse 10. He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent, you have the passage that Jackie read. This is a phenomenal statement on the part of Adam. As he looks at God in the exposure of his nakedness, he turns blame on God. Notice the three parts of what I just read. The woman you made, she gave me fruit, and I ate it. If you understand Hebrew syntax, you know the phrase, uh, you did really well today, but. You know what follows the but has more power than we have syntax that organizes our capacity to communicate. So did the Hebrew syntax. And in that culture, the first statement would be said with immense loud clarity. The second with a little less emphasis. And if you said the third, it would almost be said in a whisper. The woman you made. If you want to know who's at fault here for me choosing to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's your choice to have made her, and I would never be in this mess if she had not given me the fruit. That's what he's saying. And then, indeed, an acknowledgement. She is at fault. You created her, and now, barely with a whisper, I own that I ate it. All of us have lived in worlds where we have been blamed where we have known the sneer of someone's eyes that turn against us. And it's important for you, if you're going to do the work of engaging this material, that you don't just think in terms of abstract categories, but that you actually step into the story that you have been invited to live on this earth. Uh, I'm making the claim no one has ever escaped trauma. No one ever escapes a world in which you are not exposed and not turned against. All of us, at one level or another, have known what it is to be demeaned and degraded. But what Adam is doing is he is belittling God when he says, the woman you made. And all contempt, all contempt is a commitment to belittle 
And in that belittling, to make someone smaller than you so that you can restore power. Nakedness exposes us to weakness. It exposes us that we cannot manage and do our world as we most desire. So we need to make the world smaller before us. It doesn't take much imagination to see how politics have become a place not only of division, but really the realm of contempt. Politicians making light of others, calling them little, or somehow saying they're boring. You know the reality that if you want to be elected, you want to have a stage in which people follow you. One of the most powerful ways to do so is by belittling other human beings. But it's also contempt as a commitment to punish. It is taking vengeance out when you feel vulnerable and in pain. Now, to give you a category for this, let me tell you of a time which I was invited to a fine Christian college, conservative Christian college, as their daily lecturer. I arrived at this campus at about one in the morning. First meeting I had was at eight in the morning. Needed to get up about six to be able to think through what I was going to cover. Had about five hours sleep, and I don't do well on that little uh, of sleep. And so when I woke up, uh, the place I was staying was a registrar's small house. Uh, on the bottom floor was where they did their work, and then above was an apartment. And yet the problem was there was no bathroom shower in the apartment. It was downstairs. I don't know, when you wake up, uh, you've had very few hours sleep, your body may engage and actually move, but your brain has basically said to you, what? What are you doing? I, I'm, not, I'm not joining you. Uh, I, I'll show up with you for about an hour or two from now. And so when I went down, I had a towel, I had my cosmetics bag, I went downstairs, did all that I needed to do in the bathroom, and then I needed to go back upstairs to get dressed. And I got to the door, and I began to open it, and it was locked. I have my towel, my cosmetics, and I am naked and exposed. I, I don't know what you would do. I, I literally, I literally pulled the door, pulled the door, and it didn't open. And then I remembered what Peter did. You know, he just sort of walked through the door. So I put my hands on the lock and just said, Jesus, Jesus. I ask in your name, would you open this door? N nothing worked. No, it, it was pouring down raining. And I began to see a car or two come through the parking lot. And I was trying to shout out the window, the door, to somehow get somebody to see that I needed help. But nobody, nobody heard me. And so after about 20, 30 minutes of being in this perilous position, I, it finally dawned on me, I'm going to have to go out into the world with my towel. And so I saw a car stop, uh, a husband and wife or man and woman got out of the car, and I, I cinched down my towel as tight as I could, and, and I, I went outside and started shouting. They didn't hear me, so I started running toward them. I was about 40, 50 yards from them when they noticed me. And I could see this little conversation. I could see both, both, both had this look like, oh my God, what's happening? And then I could see the husband, I couldn't hear him, but he, I, I, I know he said to her, run. <laughs> and I, I'm running up and I'm saying, I, I, I'm your Staley lecturer, I, I, I need help. And he finally heard me and then he ran. <laughs> I, I had no other choice but to simply go back to my apartment and wait and wait. About 20 minutes passed, no one came. I know people are about to come to work. And finally, uh, it, it, again, I'm waiting and waiting, but what's happening inside of me? I want you to hear the word blame, contempt. Contempt is a commitment to belittle and punish. And we all have that ability to turn our violence on others, to blame others. And I began to blame. I, I blamed the administration for not having a key that ga they gave me at the very beginning. And then I realized the key's upstairs. They gave me the key. And then I blamed, I blamed my organization for sending me at one o'clock in the morning to arrive. And then I began to blame everybody but me. And I blamed God. Why couldn't you have op you opened doors for others? Why couldn't you open this door for me? But contempt always moves from other-centered 
ultimately to self-centered contempt. And then the words that I used against myself, uh, I, I won't put words to it here. I'll simply say that I have a very uh, sophisticated vocabulary and the blasphemies I spoke against myself were violent and cruel and crude for having failed in this way. Finally, someone came. Guy comes in, uh, you know, he was in a, a kind of a uniform. Uh, he, he looked like a young kid coming in just to sort of rescue this guy. And he came in and he goes, dude, are you the naked man? <laughs> I, I mean, some people almost seem to demand contempt, <laughs> if not inspire it. Uh, do you see how quickly contempt moves from one edge to the next. And so our hearts, when we feel exposed, want to cover ourselves with the one thing that we know will bring us immense power, and that is contempt. Where have you suffered contempt? Where have you suffered contempt because of your face? Where have you suffered contempt because of the color of your skin? Where have you suffered contempt because you didn't develop quite as quickly in high school as your peers? Or you develop more quickly than others? You know the experience of being in a locker room and being compared. All comparison is a form of contempt, of judgment that actually is a form of belittlement and punishment. If you've been in the presence of mean girls, mean boys, you've tried to join a fraternity or sorority, almost every organization binds itself to you are part of us and therefore you join us in what we hold in contempt. Our stance as believers is that we must have the courage to defraud evil from the very thing it uses most powerfully to bring about harm in our lives. If you know the word Satan, the word Satan actually means accuser. And the accuser uses the very currency of contempt to create this economy of harm in the human heart. When you were abused, the person who abused you didn't just have advantage they didn't just take something from you. They actually wanted to leave something in your life. The very nature of evil is that it wants to leave its signature on your very body and heart. Everyone who has mocked you, everyone who has brought you grief in judgment, they were serving ultimately, wittingly or unwittingly, they were serving the kingdom of darkness, wishing to leave a signature on you that you cannot escape. And that mark on us often turns us to become cold and hard and mean to others. When you have known the violence of contempt, it is heartbreaking to know that we have turned that contempt on others. As I felt so raw and exposed, I wanted someone else to pay. And when I went into my first lecture, I was angry. I had things that I wished to say, but in fact, I was belittling others who differ from me. Almost all dogmatism is a form of judgment of other views that actually arise out of this shame-contempt dynamic. If we have the courage to engage shame, to know that every one of us has no nakedness and exposure, and that we have covered ourselves with contempt, then we have the basis to begin the process of knowing what is it that Jesus wishes to do in each and every one of our lives. I was sitting a few months back with my six-year-old granddaughter, Elsa, and we were watching two eagles soar. And it was just one of those sweet moments sitting with my granddaughter, watching beauty unfold. And at one point, she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, Papa, can I ask you a question? Of course, honey. And she said, Papa, do you know that you have a very big nose?
Elsa, yes. <laughs> I'm very aware of that. And then she said, Papa, can I ask you another question? Of course, sweetheart. She said, Papa, does your nose ever make you sad? Uh, how does a six-year-old know that your face, your body, is the basis of evil wishing to come and make comparisons and judgments, and that others have joined to be able to say to you, you are not enough. You are too small, you are too big, you are too tall, you are too short. I, I told her a story when I was in third or fourth grade. A bunch of older, not older, but probably my age and slightly older kids surrounded me in a kind of round. They went around and they danced together and they began saying, Danny, Danny the nose, his nose is bigger than a hose. Even as she is asking me the question, Papa, does your nose ever make you sad? What came back to mind was an experience of so many decades ago. I'm 65. This event happened when I was eight or nine years of age. And one of my experience, decades later, a sense of shame and wanting, even in the presence of my granddaughter, to be invisible. What evil wants is to mark you so that you become enraged or mark you so that you become invisible. And what I told her in that context was, I, I, I heard four or five rounds of this. And then, because in my trauma, I have learned to fight. Most of us learn to flee or to freeze. But in this context, I took the biggest bully on, hit him square in the face, knowing that I would be beat to a pulp later. It didn't matter, because all you need to do with bullies is hit them once, and you let them know that you're crazy enough that indeed don't ever mess with me again. But be careful of your applause because the reality is Jesus is so other. What he does is he invites us to the generosity of his eyes. When scripture says, do you not know that it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance? Do you hear it is not ferocity? It, it is not punitive, punishing. It is not just bravado that changes our lives. What changes our lives is the humility and courage to be able to admit every one of us has been tagged. Every one of us has been marked by the presence of evil, and that dark work of contempt has silenced you. Or it has made you so angry that you are shill, shrill, and nobody listens. We have become what evil wishes for us to be, and that is tortured and violent against ourselves or against others. And if we understand the work of the gospel, it is that he looks in your eyes and he offers you the tender, clear knowledge of what you have done, who you have harmed, how you have harmed your own heart, and then what he offers is the promise of this, what the psalmist says in one thir Psalm 139, verse 17, my thoughts about you are precious. I don't know how you woke today, but if you awaken today with a sense that I am honored, the very nature of creation creates delight and honor, and what evil wishes is for delight to be turned to belittlement and for honor to be turned into violence and punishment. And for us to understand the glory, glory of the gospel is to hear what Paul says in Romans 2, 4 when he says this, why, why do you treat the kindness of God with contempt? Uh, our hope, my hope for this jubilee is that you will begin to name something of the war of your own shame and contempt and where it has turned your own heart, heart hard, where something of your heart has become silent, where something of your own heart has become less than what creation has entitled you to be and what recreation brings you back to become. 
For us to hear, it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance. It's the open door for us to be able to enter into creation and then to bless recreation and then to be able to face a world of contempt and to be able to say together as individuals and as a community, hell no. Hell no to judgment. Hell no to politicians who turn their candidacies into judgments and belittlements of others. I hope there are women, particularly in this room, who will one day run for office and do so in a way in which you choose, you choose to honor your opponent. You take your positions, you take your understanding, but you offer the presence of kindness as indeed not merely a palliative, not just a return to what was meant to be, but as a taste of the coming kingdom. We mark this world with kindness. And we stand, hell no, against contempt, and we offer this world, heaven yes, the blessing of delight and the blessing of honor. Thank you.